This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell, and joining me today in the studio are the Toledo Symphony's president and CEO, Zach Vassar, also principal second violin and artistic administrator, Merwin Sue, and we have a very special guest by phone for whom I have a fanfare. Hang on, here we go. (laughs) <laughs> Please welcome violinist Kirsten Leong. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. That was, that was amazing. <laughs> you like that fanfare? We're going to play that for you, like, every time that you walk on stage. Quite something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll have E major trumpets all ready for you as you walk <laughs> on stage for Bartok. It'll yes. be not jarring at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Those might have to be custom made. We'll see. Those trumpets. Well, Kirsten Young is, in addition to being a wonderful violinist, he's going to be here at the Paris Style in the Toledo Museum of Art performing music of Bela Bartok with the Toledo Symphony, the Violin Concerto No. 2. This is also a program that has music of Stravinsky and Franz Liszt. So it's a wonderfully fun and interesting program. I think a lot of folks probably know Petrushka. If they don't know it by name, they may know the music. And they certainly know the second Hungarian Rhapsody but they don't necessarily know that much about the violin concerto curse that you're bringing to the Paris style. I wonder if we can talk about that. But before we do that, let's hear your story, sort of get to know you a little bit, and you can just tell us, you know, from soup to nuts, how you got from the beginning to where you are now. And let me pull up a little music for you. <laughs> I think this is appropriate, right? Merwin is a fellow Canadian. Merwin is a fellow Canadian of yours, uh, Kirsten. Oh, that's great. So why don't you go ahead and tell us tell us more about yourself? Indeed, yeah. So um, I was born and raised in Ottawa, Canada, of course, after hearing the national anthem. It's, you know, it's natural to, to mention that uh, I was born in Ottawa, Canada. I came from a very sort of musical family. Could say, music was always just you know a big part of my life since since I could since I could remember really, and uh, started violin when I was four, you know as part of just you know the musical activities and uh, my life really changed at age 13 when I when I went to the Menuhin the international Yehudi Menuhin violin competition um, in Oslo Norway that year 2010, and uh, and won it. And so that was a big sort of big shock in a way and big sort of it immediately opened up my my eyes to the, the bigger musical world at play and it sort of, yeah, sort of opened me to a, to a totally different reality in a sense. And I think in the years following that, then I really started to not only to develop as a violinist and as a person, but also to realize the power of music and the necessity of it. And mm. so that really became my life's essence, sort of my life's mission as well, you know, to to be as positive uh, and as, as, yeah, as positive a force as I can to people around me through the music I play and just to be, uh, you know, in general, a positive influence. Yay! <laughs> yeah, we, we give you a little, little applause for that. That's a wonderful story. Merwin, you want to say something? I wanted to kind of mention that um, I, as a as a teacher of students, um, I wanted to thank you for the many videos that you put out, um, your etude series in particular. Um, as somebody who did not grow up with a love, uh, like an innate love for Rode and or like Kreutzer, to be able to have somebody like you present it, not just. Uh, technically, but with such kind of musical fervor. I think it was really wonderful and kind of a real gift during the pandemic times when it was really tricky to have students be motivated to 
do things like their scales and etudes and having somebody like you putting putting those etudes on YouTube and really kind of examining them in a systematic but really sincere manner. I, I, I just wanted to express my appreciation for that. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. And also, if any of my students are listening, <laughs> make sure <laughs> to check out his Etude series on YouTube. Kirsten, that brings up this idea of how you engage with your audience. I mean, not just through performing in the studio, but also off the stage, through social media, that sort of thing, through modern technology. I mean, what is the importance for you? How, how do you use social media to keep in touch with your fans? Yeah, no, for sure. I think um, it's it sort of goes with the idea of not only sort of having people come to the concert hall, but also as you, the artist, bringing music to the people, um, not only in the physical sense, you know, sort of outreach, in-person outreach and all that stuff, but social media, of course, now has become being the powerful tool that it is these days, um, an essential part of that. And I think it's... Uh, it's it's actually amazing. I mean, sort of seeing how many people, let's say, would stumble across just an interesting, let's say, a, a video filmed of violin playing close up, you know, from an interesting perspective and sort of, you know, latching onto that or being fascinated and otherwise probably would have never had the um, the chance or, or, yeah, I guess the chance to, to witness something like that and to, to also get the idea of going to a to a concert, to an orchestral concert. And I think these are just very, it's it's a very powerful thing in the sense that, you know, uh, there isn't, you know, there it, it isn't limited to anyone. I think it's just something that can reach everyone and everything, you know. So it's, uh, it's uh, for me, it's it's a powerful tool. It's also very much, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important for me in the sense that to not only just spread music to the young generation, but also just to bring the art to the people, you know. Yeah. Um, we're joined by Zach Vassar. Zach, you want to say hi to Kirsten? I'll say hi. <laughs> Hello, Zach. Hello. So excited to see you perform with the Peristyle. To, uh, perform at the Peristyle. Well, speaking of which, let's talk about this Bartok Violin Concerto because I'm not too familiar with it. Uh, Kirsten, how long have you been playing the Bartok Concerto? So the first time, I believe the first time I played it was back in 2018. So this was a, and, and funnily enough, actually, right, that the last concert I gave before everything shut down for the pandemic, like just before the start of the pandemic, the, literally the day before, this was the last piece hmm. I performed oh, wow. in concert. And so in, in a sense, it has a sort of special because maybe associating with that memory, it has a special place in my heart. But even before that, it was, it was, um, it was the kind of piece that, you know, kind of hits you in a visceral way when you discover it. It's, uh, it's incredibly, I mean, it's such of a grand scale and of a certain kind of complexity and in a way extremity in a sense that it, it sort of just, you know, it captures everything that you could feel, let's say, in the, in the human emotional spectrum that, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was an immediate draw for me. It's interesting because Bartok is is one of those composers that has, you know, different sides to him. Sometimes you hear the folk music mm -hmm. and it's very uh, palatable, shall we say. It might even be familiar to some listeners. But when you talk about like the violin concerto and some other works in particular, Bartok really goes down that road of, of int intricacy, you know, mm -hmm. of, of creating... Mm -hmm real strong emotions through his very distinct musical language. I wonder if you can tell us, Kirsten, what attracts you to this concerto in the first place? Yeah, so for, of course, I mean, there's a, there's always that folk element there. I mean, of course, as you said, you know, different lev differing levels of accessibility, if you will. Like, you know, I'm thinking Bartok Romanian dances, for mm -hmm. example, right. as something that, you know, most people would probably have heard of, you know, but then, of course, going to the other side of the spectrum. And it's funny because, I mean, a lot of the violin works that he wrote, this concerto included, the violin sonatas, for example, they're very, they, they're very far fetched. I guess they, they reach very far in terms of, let, let's say, the limits of 
his language and his experimentation. Like, he really went all out. Was he a violinist? Because he wrote a lot in that repertoire. He, he, I think he associated a lot with, mm-hmm. with violinists. Like, for example, with this, uh, this concerto was, was a request um, by a, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but by a violinist named Sheke. Yeah. So Zoltan Sheke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Merwin, so, Merwin is yeah. nodding his head. I was going to say, welcome to my world, where you have all kinds of <laughs> names that you don't know how to pronounce. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a name you don't know how to pronounce, Brad. Uh, the trick is just to pretend like you know how to announce it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, for you, Kirsten, do you feel like it, it's particularly challenging for the violin? I mean, what you know, when you when you listen to it, it looks like it's really tough and really hard. I mean, how how do you attack or approach putting this into your repertoire? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's a different it's a different kind of virtuosity and a different kind of difficulty, I guess, when approaching it when you first learn it. Then let's say you know a Tchaikovsky concerto or a you know Lalo Symphony Espanol, you know, any of these sort of more traditionally violinistic pieces. I guess in this case. You know, um, the finger work is always quite awkward. Mm. And also because, you know, the, let's say the harmonies and everything is sort of, everything is a little less predictable. So, or less linear in a sense. So I guess a lot of it would also, you would, muscle memory would play a bigger part in, let's say, learning and, let's say, getting it to your system and memorizing and all that. But uh, I also, you know, in, in a case like this where you have such a, you have such a, I mean, a language that brings out such imagination in a way, such colors that you also try and just let yourself, let yourself go and, and kind of just, you know, really embrace that awkwardness and that, mm. and that, uh, you know, that difficulty in a, in, in a way that can give way to just freedom. Mm. And, say, and, and I think that's a big part of this music as well is to depict, I guess, the freedom of folk life. And of the great, you know, of the great countryside, of the great land, you know, it's it's very, you know, it feels as if it's painting the land in a way, um, yeah. and the people and the culture within. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, I, I would say it's um, to even though it's physically awkward, let's say technically awkward, that you would focus on the general, the, the overview of it, you know, and the emotions that that uh, are brought with it, and then you work sort of inward from there. Yeah. It's interesting because we've had kind of a few pieces recently that I feel like have had very nostalgic elements to them. And even though we've talked a lot about how, you know, how it stretches the bounds technically, this concerto, to me, it's a very nostalgic piece. It's mm-hmm. a piece that's that's filled with longing and I think that's what that's what hits a listener to me. Like you hear, I mean, I mean, it was in a way when I first saw the score of it, it surprised me because I was like, oh, I had no idea there were quarter tones because it just it was so it it felt like so integral to the material. It didn't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like this sort of like kind of show off the element of low this is this extra thing the violin can do is just felt like Bartok needed this to to put forward this very specific type of longing and fear it, it is a very emotional piece yeah. and i think that's one it, of the things about it that i like folk music without yeah. the actual folk tunes <laughs> basically but merwin <laughs> you said something interesting about uh, quarter tones there are there are quarter tones can you talk about some of the sort of the the essence of the music well, I would probably leave that to the soloist. He's yeah. probably. De- I, I've, so- I'm looking at you, but I'm talking to Kirsten. So. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell us about the the quarter tones, and that's something that you you said, Merwin, that you had not been aware of that until you looked at the music. Yeah. And I wasn't aware of it until you talked about being aware of it, looking at the music. I mean, what did you think, Kirsten, when you saw this sort of thing on paper? Yeah, no, I just thought fun. You know? <laughs> I guess that was the first <laughs> that was the first uh, reaction, you know. But I think yeah, just the the presence of quarter tones, um, it sort of it sort of implies, I guess, sort of going into a different, you know, sort of getting, let's say, out of the concert hall and going somewhere, let's say, where 
you know, there's a little bit more sort of, uh, you could say, yeah, of course, um, folklore, folkloristic, you know, um, folky and, and sort of more primal uh, tendencies, I guess, you know, in a sense, because it sort of, it, it sort of implies to me something archaic and something kind of just, you know, from very much of the people, like, you know, to, to those micro, whether it's microtones or quarter tones, in this case, quarter tones, um, but it does give, it, it, it helps a lot in giving that sort of very, um, how do you say, sort of countryside peasantry, yeah. you know, burned into the heart of the people, you know, that kind mm. of feeling, you know, folk music that's been handed down and it's it's just so, it speaks so true. It definitely helps in giving that image in this concerto, you know, and, and really does, I mean, in, in, in flying colors. And I think that's the thing. It's like you don't hear it as a quarter tonal passage. You hear it as, oh my gosh, it sounds just like like you know you're 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 you've ripped the roof off the concert hall and you're letting in the outside air. It just it it's it's really what it's astonishingly well written. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that string players are very much in Bartok's debt for is just how he, how through his string quartets, through the violin sonatas, through the solo sonata, which is still my Everest. Mm. It's still the piece every summer. I'm like, okay, I'm finally going to learn that stupid solo <laughs> sonata because it's just an amazing piece of music, but it's so many expletives deleted. Yeah, hard. Kirsten did it when he was three, right? <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> but it's, it's a bear of peace, and I love it so much. But like he, Bartok, was just, just was able to create all of these like expand the repertoire of things you can do on the violin, but for purely expressive purposes. I think it's really important for people to bring that openness to the concert hall when they go to watch it so they don't think that, you know, you're just kind of sliding around and playing out of tune, right? (laughs) We want want everybody to know that we meant it that way. I appreciate the disclaimer. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Beware, there are quarter tones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we should put the signs up, right? The signs up. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like when you warn people ahead. with epilepsy about, you know, yeah. strobe, strobe lights, lights that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But it's actually interesting that the premiere, I, I did not know this until just kind of preparing for the show, that the premiere was given just a couple hours east in Cleveland. Well, oh, yeah. yeah the this, U.S. premiere. Yeah. No, I think the world premiere. The uh, first premiere was Mengelberg in uh, Amsterdam. Really? Concerned oh, okay. All right. Well, you win the quiz, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I came to Cleveland and um, uh, I forget who conducted it, but it was uh, it Cleveland, New York, San Francisco, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what we're here for is to, you yeah. know, track these answers down. Now, I, I always imagine, though, this dialogue that must have happened between uh, Mengelberg and Bartok. It'd just be a fascinating <laughs> conversation to yeah. listen to, right? Fly on the wall. Yeah. As it were. Yeah. Well, the concert is uh, Saturday. It's May 13th at 8 o'clock p.m. at the Toledo Museum of Art Paris Style. Kirsten Leong is going to be joining the Toledo Symphony for the first time, right? It's your Toledo debut, right, Kirsten? Indeed, yeah. So looking forward. Have, have you been out in this area of the country before? Not at all. It will be my first time even just being being there, so I'm very excited to. to wow. We'll even have some decent weather for you, I think. Oh, now you had to go jinx it. Thank you, Brad. Um, I meant it'll be raining the yeah. entire time you're here. Depends what your definition of decent is, right? Yeah. Uh, Chris, and I'd love to go back. Uh, a couple minutes ago, you mentioned that you performed this concerto right on the entryway into COVID. Um, was this one of those um, performances that you look back and then suddenly you realize that was your last you know, concert for a little while, or was it like one of those things where the cameras were rolling, but there was no audience? I mean, what was the, what was the layout for that performance? And then I'm going to ask you how that shapes your, your interpretation now as you replay it. Oh, I just, uh, yeah, a few things come to mind for sure. I mean, that was right before. So basically there was still, I mean, it was still normal audience. They decided Mm -hmm. not to cancel the concert, even though they were already receiving advisories. Mm -hmm. This was in Nova Scotia. In Canada, mm-hmm. and so you know, luckily on them, they didn't sort of cancel the concert and you know sort of go away. So so every the hall was full, the mm. energy was kind of in a way a little crazy because I yeah. think everyone knew that things were going to shut down, yeah. and and everything uh, you know after that would be quite uncertain. But of course, for you know for that reason and for also sort of you know uh, a few other reasons in my personal life at the time, I remember just 
playing my guts out, you know, mm-hmm. and this, and this, this piece was the perfect, in a way it was sort of, it's a piece that, you know, just like, just like Morwin said, it's something that is very longing and very nostalgic. It's just brimming with, 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 uh, with emotion, mm-hmm. with, uh, strong emotion, this piece. And so it was really like the perfect, it was the perfect piece to play at that particular moment. And I think mm-hmm. everyone sort of came away with it. Uh, you know, just at least if there's going to be uncertainty going forward, that that was an occasion to, let's say, to, to cherish, to remember. Wow. And, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just remember it sort of being like the, the last performance of a certain era, you know, yeah. now that you sort of like, when you look back at the pandemic and everything's a bit sort of, uh, a bit sort of fragmented in the memory and, and sort of, you don't, you kind of lose track of time. But I just remember that was sort of like the end of an era. So that's how it felt. It was quite, yeah, it was quite interesting. I'm rather fascinated by that. I think probably it will take us another decade or so to be able to look back on this. It still feels very now, you know, it's a, yeah. a, a current challenge. But I think those final concerts that happened in, you know, February and March of 2020, um, everybody's going to have, uh, I remember the last concert we did before. And as you're talking about this concerto and even, you know, Merwin, you're beautiful, a description of tearing the roof off the the concert hall and letting the fresh air and it light has in. kind of a Disney it, element to it, actually. What, that was not intended. <laughs> <laughs> but what a beautiful, what a beautiful concerto to go out on. And, and thinking about the nostalgia, you're kind of like preemptive nostalgia yeah. for a time that you knew people were going to be looking back, and you probably looked back yourself. So what a what a divine concerto to play at that time. And and I'm so excited that you'll bring it to us, and probably with new memories to make. Yay! I got I got cheers for that. All right. <laughs> yes, but you didn't get the applause. Yeah, let me, th- let thank me you, pull Peanut that. Gallery. There you go. <laughs> well, uh, Kirsten, let me ask you this: Do you remember back in 2016 when you did a, a 20 questions with the Violin Channel on YouTube? Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Do. Okay. Well, I have a quiz spelled K W I Z because it's a Kirsten quiz. <laughs> and this is about your interview with the violin channel. What I'm going to do? Oh, this is a little meta. There were there were twenty <laughs> twenty different questions originally, but I chose ten of them, and I have your answers mixed in with some other answers, possible answers. And so we're going to go through the quiz. And Merwin and Zach well, are going to try to guess this. I mean, can, can so, I ask? Are, are we trying to anticipate what Kirsten would have said in 2016, or are yeah. we trying to see if Kirsten himself can be consistent with his previous answer? Well, we'll find out. Oh, okay. right? wow. As we go along, <laughs> I mean, we may ask you, Kirsten, if you want to update any of your answers. Yeah, here. this is kind of a weird retrospective. Actually, you know? I, I like this though because <laughs> usually Brad throws in some sort of like trick questions like yeah. all of the above or none of the above and right. yeah. we can't do we can't that do when that. when there's when... a definitive answer unless he had multiple answers to yeah. one question just stay off your phones mm. don't go to youtube <laughs> don't start looking for all that <laughs> darn it let me bring up a so kirsten you can't give these answers right away you maybe you can give the correct answer but what we're going to do is i'm going to go through all 10 questions and then we're going to go back and we'll get the correct answers and maybe okay. the updated answers if you want to give those to us. Okay. Let me pull up a little music here. Not by Bartok. <laughs> That's really slow. It's very slow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's from uh, Imuzichi, the ensemble yeah. Imuzichi. Oh, yeah. Me, uh, the, yeah, but I not the Imuzichi de Montreal. <laughs> it's not no. the Montreal based one, it's the, the uh, Italian I one. I think it's the Italian okay. one. Yeah. If we're in Montreal, it'd be colder. Okay. Well, the <laughs> it'd only be I'm, winter. We we have the <laughs> we have the rights to play this music, so I'm going to stick with it. Okay. Sounds I, good. I couldn't find any bar talk. All right. None of these questions have to do with bar talk. The first question is: What was the happiest moment of Kirsten's life? Was it recording his first album? Was it winning the Yehudi Menuhin competition? Or was it playing with the Toledo Symphony? A, B, <laughs> or C? Okay. Okay. Second question. What is the side of Kirsten that the public never sees? Is it that he is a video game freak, a gourmet cook, or a stamp collector? A, B, or C? 
Question number three. What is Kirsten's favorite pastime? Is it playing sports? Is it watching TV? Or is it going out to eat? Hmm. Two of those are for me, actually. Number four. <laughs> number four. What does Kirsten say is the most important thing in life? Is it family? Is it career? Or is it doing what you love? Number five. Kirsten's favorite violinist. Was it Yehudi Menuhin, Henrik Schiering, or David Oistrak? A, B, or C? All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> Number six, what would Kirsten like to have invented? A time machine for the sake of music, a transporter for the sake of instant travel, or a toaster because he really likes toast? A, B, or C? <laughs> Question number seven. No clues, Kirsten. <laughs> what what profession would Kirsten be doing if not for the violin? Would it be that he would be a double bass player? He would be a conductor of orchestras, that is. Or he would be a conductor of trains, A, B, or C. Oh. Okay. Now, keeping in mind that this was in 2016, Kirsten's favorite movie. <laughs> was it Moonrise Kingdom? The Grand Budapest Hotel, or Ex Machina, A, B, or C? Only two more questions left before we go back. The next one is, what is Kirsten's favorite musical work? Is it the Bach Sonata and Partitas? Is it the Beethoven Kreutzer Sonata? Or is it the Bartok Second Violin Concerto, you A, did say B, there'd or be C? No, there'd be no Bartok, so... Oh, yeah, I yeah. forgot. Mm. <laughs> And finally, what is Kirsten's life motto? Is it seize the day? Is it no pain, no gain? Or is it just do it? A, B, or C. Okay. Uh, we, we're about to learn a lot about Kirsten, right? <laughs> yeah, do, you feel, do you feel pretty uh, confident in your answers, Merwin and Zach? Absolutely. Yeah? Okay. Well, Kirsten, do you feel like you know the answers? <laughs> Do you remember? I'm kind of nervous, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're kind of on trial right now. <laughs> I promise these are straight from your mouth, right? <laughs> it's just, that's okay. even more embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Through my soul in retrospect. Oh. Yeah. What a thing. This is your life. Again, seven years later. <laughs> these are from the Violin Channels. The Violin Channels 20 Questions with Curse and Leong that happened in 2016 on YouTube. Okay, the first question was, what was the happiest moment of Kirsten's life? A, B, or C? The answer was B, winning the menuin competition. Yeah? Did you guys get that? Merwin got it. Zach got it. You yeah. both got it. Yay! Kirsten, did you get it? Yeah, yeah. I okay. <laughs> any, any adjustments to that answer uh, seven years out? You know, in a way, it's it's. Uh, I would still I would still stick with the same answer because, in a way, looking back, it was still like you know, just uh, I guess also from a personal standpoint, you know, just many things just came together. Of course, you know, the competition mm -hmm. went well, but also I guess it was a real sort of a, a consolidating moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. At that time, it was sort of just immediately, let's say. Um, reaching a, a level of self-awareness and of you know awareness of the of the the outside world so yeah i would still say that for mm. sure that's great okay now what is the side of Kirsten that the public never sees his back <laughs> <laughs> it is a he's a video game freak are you still a video game player Kirsten? uh not anymore not anymore, actually. No, oh, okay. I, I wouldn't say I would. I guess I'm more of an avid reader these days. You know? Oh, good, oh. good for you. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, people there's hope for the rest of us. <laughs> people, people don't pay to watch you read, so <laughs> that's good. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure there's somebody who would. Yeah, but but I'm saying <laughs> that the public would never see that side of him, also, right? <laughs> I was hoping you would be a gourmet cook, but you know, such is life. Okay, number three. Oh uh, well. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> Your favorite pastime was A, playing sports. Everybody oh, get sure. that? Did you get uh, the second one, the video game freak? I didn't. I didn't. No, no, you did. Zach or Zach did not get it. Merwin got it. And then, and then we flipped on the second. Or the favorite third pastime, one. and then you flipped. So you guys yeah. are still even, two right? Two and two. Two and two. Okay. Um, you still play sports, Kirsten? 
Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I, let's say not as as much organized sport as before, but I would say just being, uh, just sort of keeping in shape in general, yeah. physical fitness and all that. Mm-hmm. I think that's still, I mean, it's actually more important to me than um, than ever, you know, when it comes to just like maintaining the shoulders, shoulder health, back health, posture health, you know, mm-hmm. just staying active and, um, you know, whether it's just, you know, playing casual tennis or um, or just sort of going out and, and playing soccer sometimes, or even just, you know, a light workout, that stuff is, yeah. it, it does, it, it does a lot of good in a way. Yeah. Well, as people will see, I mean, playing the violin, especially something like the Bartok is a real physical endeavor. You have to be in, in fairly decent shape to do that, huh? Indeed. Yeah. I think it's, and also the fact that, you know, violin playing in general is, is quite unnatural as well you know there's a there's a lot of it's physically strenuous but in a way that in a way sort of causes your body to twist oh yeah in mm-hmm. unnatural ways and because of that i think it's also it's just all the more important to try to keep aligned and to try and keep let's say the other ranges of motion in your mm-hmm. muscles uh, are, uh, are you length, let's say are you left-handed or right-handed it's i write left-handed i would say hmm. for most things i'm left-handed um hmm. but uh, it's kind of weird because I guess I, I I kick with my right foot. I use chopsticks with my right hand, and wow, you know, it's kind of a, a kind of a mix. Uh, yeah, it's kind of weird. Do you play tennis right or left? <laughs> I would I would say right. Actually, yeah, I play with my right hand. Yeah. Do you think that being a violinist has affected your ambidextrous <laughs> abilities? It could have. It could have. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that I'd say I guess both both hands are are you know vigorous but doing different things in a way very different motions so maybe that could have had a you know had a part in it I'm not sure that's interesting yeah. we, we've gone down a whole different road here of of questioning if I had to choose a tennis opponent based on their instrument and I knew they're violinist I would want to make sure that they <laughs> they were not playing with their bowing arm <laughs> yes <laughs> it's yeah. just way too fluid and strong <laughs> yeah good to know. Yeah. Anyway, back to the quiz. Oh, there was a quiz. That's right. Yeah. yeah. This is question number four. What does Kirsten say is the most important thing in life at the time? This, again, was 2016. The answer was C, doing what you love, right? What do you say, Kirsten? Is that right? Yeah, I would say I would still I would still stick by that, but I'll also say people as well. Mm. Uh, well, I you, would still you, say, like, you know, just, yeah, like just keeping, keeping the, the people who you enjoy being with your loved ones close uh-huh. and, uh, and, and just be treasuring the moments that you have with the mm. people that you enjoy being with. I, think, I would say that's just as important as doing what you love. Yeah. Okay. Your favorite violinist, I'm going to let you answer this. Was it Yehudi Menuhin, Henrik Shearing, or David Oistrach? Yeah, this is this is quite a, a loaded. I remember saying sharing. I think it was sharing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. indeed. That's yeah. that is what Yay! you said. Yeah. <laughs> because I think I was. I guess it's funny because you know it it, it changes all. The, I mean, this is such a. This is one of those questions. Yeah. That I guess the answer to which it changes all the time. But I think at that time I was going through a sharing mm-hmm. binge. I think you know, especially oh, when it nice came choice to, of words for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sharing binge. Sharing is caring. Sharing binge, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think it's specifically the his Bach and part, his yeah. sonatas and partitas. Nope. You know? I'm going to go change my answer to number nine. Now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <it's>, yeah. <laughs> so who's your who's your favorite violinist now, besides yourself? You know, oh, um, I would have to say, you know, when it came to just the 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 achievement of of what he wanted to of mm. of just the highest level of what he wanted to do, I guess what he, I would say, Heifetz. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, he's yeah, not on the because, list, uh, so <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I, you know, because it's all the 20, I, if I could say all the 20th century violins, I would, because each of them has sort of left something a little bit in me in terms mm-hmm. of, the, you know, their temperament and their style and all that. Um, but I would say just in terms of just, just the, how do you say, it, just rigor mm-hmm. and poise and in a way sort of integrity, I would say, uh, Heifetz. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Merwin was hoping you would say him, but 
I I thought it was Oystruck. I I was I I I was actually pretty sure that. about that one, and I was wrong. W- totally. What did you choose, Zach? I had menu, and I figured that the competition might have dipped it in his favor. Wow! So you guys are still yeah. technically tied. Yeah. Right as we move into the second half of this quiz. So the next question is: What would Kirsten like to have invented? And the answer was a time machine. Was that A or B? That was A. Oh, okay. A. I was wrong there. Do you still wish you'd invented a time machine, Kirsten? Yeah, I guess so. You know, you go back to prehistoric times and go, you know, hang out with some dinosaurs or, you know, go hang out with the ancient Egyptians. I think that would be quite a cool thing, to yeah. be honest. Nefertiti and the dinosaurs. I just, I just yeah, thought that exactly. as a, as a touring violinist, that a transporter would be so effective in your day to day life. I, I, so I you had chose that, that. I chose that. Did okay. anybody choose a toaster? I chose no. toaster. You chose toaster. I did. I thought the first two were too um, sci fi, and I thought toaster was a much more fascinating <laughs> angle uh, <laughs> for somebody who probably spends a lot of time on the road. You might want a toaster. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, a, a travel yeah, no, toaster. It's, it's one of those things you can't live without. If you want a piece of toast, you have to have a toaster. Maybe you could use your time machine and zoom forward as the toast just <laughs> bakes in the sun. But I think a toaster would be much more effective. So I really would encourage you to reconsider that You could answer. invent both the time machine and the toaster at the same time. Kirsten, do you even like toast? Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't like toast? toast? You know. <laughs> Say again? It's, it's an... It's an it's an essential. It's an essential item, you know. So and yeah, no, I have to say the toast is up there. You know, yeah. I think uh, it's, it's, it's just like it's bread. It's just item, crispier. You know? Yeah. So Brad <laughs> always has to pull like about a thirty-second clip as an advertise, kind of like to, to draw people in. And I think that's going to be the clip. I can hear it now. Kirsten, do you like toast? We'll be like advertising this radio show. Yeah, let's make the clip right now. Kirsten, do you like toast? <laughs> yeah. Love me some toast. <laughs> Excellent. With or without butter? Oh, with butter. Oh, that's it. <laughs> okay, enough about toast. We have a few more questions. This is like the longest quiz in history. No. This is the only part where the answers take, you know, we, We've much literally longer. talked more about this than Bartok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're going to mention Bartok when we get Someday, to Someday people music. will celebrate this quiz as much as we celebrate the Bartok concerto. Yeah, only if we have a time machine, right? <laughs> or and a toast. toaster. <laughs> toaster time machine. Or, would, or, or people would start to associate Bartok concerto with toast. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the sequel to Hot Tub Time Machine is Toaster Time Machine, right? (laughs) Wow. Okay, what profession would Kirsten be doing if it wasn't for the violin? Would he play the double bass? Would he conduct orchestras? Or would he conduct trains, A, B, or C? Well, I gave a couple of answers, but uh, I'm going to go with number A, the double bass player. And Kirsten, can you tell us about this double bass thing? Because you mentioned that you're... Your parents or your family wanted you to play, or you wanted to play the double bass, and they steered you to the violin. How, how did that work out? Yeah, so, you know, actually, it's funny because the double bass was the first instrument I wanted to play. I just sort of saw it, and when I pointed to it as a toddler and said, you know, uh, Mom and Dad, I want to do that, you know. And uh, and they sort of looked at me, and they looked at each other kind of in a worried, you know, and, and gave each other a worried look, and were like, no, here's a, here's a smaller one. <laughs> you know, otherwise, they would have to buy a new car, or they'd have to buy a van or a space shuttle, right? Just to transport <laughs> it. So, and so, uh, you know, so they gave me a little mini version, which happened to stay mini all this time. <laughs> did, it, did it double as you a know. toaster by any chance? <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, they, I guess that you know a mini a mini double bass with a toaster with it. So your favorite movie back in 2016 was B, the Grand Budapest Hotel. <laughs> yeah. Can you, you you have an update for us? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, so so nowadays, if I'm going to change, if I would change my answer, it would be something more classic, like uh, Shawshank Redemption, or something, the stuff that I would rewatch again and again, Lord of the Rings series. But I think I said Grand Budapest back then, because I just, like, right before that interview, I saw it on the plane, and I didn't end up going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I guess that was a good, a good, because usually I do, you know, and so I think that was a good measure of just, I think I was just intrigued by the whole style of it, the sort of whole, yeah. the whole absurdity of the whole 
style and beautiful yeah. visuals and yeah it was it was very entertaining so, it, yeah. it kept you engaged much like the uh, Bartok Violin Concerto, right? <laughs> There's something about oh, yeah, Bartok absolutely. and Wes Anderson that I could put together in a cage match. <laughs> I, I want to think through this. You had another Wes Anderson as an option there, though, didn't you, Brad? Um, Moonrise Kingdom? Yeah. Yeah. I figured you would have an update for that, Kirsten, so I'm glad to hear that uh, that you're looking at the classic movies. Except when you say classic, you know, I think of, like, Jimmy Stewart and... You know, uh, yeah. people from the 40s and 50s and 60s, or even back to the 30s with The Wizard of Oz, um, you kind of are dating me by calling those films classic. <laughs> I was well into adulthood when those came out. Anyway. <laughs> it's okay, oh, Brad. We could, we, could say, uh, we could also say Casablanca then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah, something I watched recently, which I really enjoyed. It's very a great much. movie. I yeah. like that yeah. very much. All right, your favorite musical work. Was it Bach, Beethoven, or Bartok, A, B, or C? Those are all Bs, by the way. I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer that you gave at the time was Bach, Sonatas and Partitas. Did everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you guys still tied? Still tied. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Remember when they were shooting daggers at each other and <laughs> in between the questions. Kirsten, here's a question for you. What does Bach have to do with Bartok? Because you played both, and, and I mean, what are the, the differences between playing this older music by Bach and this more modern music by Bartok? In some strange way, it seems to me like they would connect with each other, but what, what are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, no, they do, in a sense. I think, uh, no, very much, I mean, you would, I, would, I would see Bach, and the reason why I said Bach in the first place in that interview, and it still is, I would say, uh, my answer is just because it's the it's sort of like the 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 building blocks or the the backbone, you know. Um, violinistically, also the you know we would see that I guess as the Bible, you know, for violinists mm -hmm. sonatas and partitas because it's so it just sort of hits right to the yeah it's sort of like essence that's sort of very stripped like it's stripped just to the essence of it and and pure in that sense. Yeah. And covers, I guess, the the most sort of yeah, most grounded of techniques, you know, choral things and you know, legato and just you know all that stuff that that gets combined and that stuff, of course, very naturally carries over to a lot of other things. Um, but in a sense, it's 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 weird because I would say yes, there is a per perhaps I mean there is this kind of seriousness or this sort of poignancy to playing Bach because of, let's say, you would associate something, you know, quite spiritual or even religious, I guess. And in the same sense, there's some passages in the Bartok, which, you know, let's say in, in, in very extreme color changes from something very rambunctious and very sort of, um, uh, sort of very cacophonous to a lot of these colors, which are very intimate and in a, in a way feel like, let's say, a plea or a kind of, prayer in some senses. I guess there's there's moments in that in Bartok where, you know, you do feel like that's just, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's another reflection of that. Yeah. I guess very, you know, ne necessary part of the human condition, which is just to, to, to look inside the heart and to strip yourself of, of all, all layers in a way. And there's, there's a, that's what's great about the Bartok is that there's so many, um, yeah, there's so many, contrasting moods and, and states, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, we do have one more question. The this last question. This might be the moment of truth. Yeah, the moment of Merlin truth. Merlin and Zach. Yeah, we need a drum roll. <laughs> Is there a drum roll? Uh, I do have a drum roll. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not very long, so. <laughs> Kirsten's life motto, right? Let me try that again. Kirsten's life motto is seize the day, no pain, no gain, or just do it. The answer was just do it. Oh, Zach wins. Zach is the winner. Yay! Great job, Zach. Zach finally beat Merwin. A little slam down here. It's only taken us seven years. <laughs> yeah. Kirsten, did I get that right? Yeah, please say yes, please say yes. Yeah. <laughs> so my other question is, what does playing the violin have to do with Nike shoes, right? Just do it? Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess I'll have to go on stage now with some Nike Airs or something. Yeah, there you go. We can accommodate that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. We'll totally allow it. We had a sneaker <laughs> culture exhibit at the museum a couple, couple years ago. We can totally make that work. Amazing. 
Amazing. So the concert once more is happening on Saturday. It's May 13th at 8 o'clock p.m. at the Toledo Museum of Art Paris Style. Music of Igor Stravinsky. We'll hear Petrushka, also the Hungarian Rhapsody Number no. 2 of Franz Liszt. And special guest violinist Kirsten Leong will be here performing the Violin Concerto Number no. 2 by Bela Bartok, Elaine Trudell at the podium for that concert. You can find more information at ToledoSymphony.com. You can call the box office up at 419-246-8000. And you can check out the streaming uh, website of the Toledo Symphony at stream.artstoledo.com. I want to thank everybody who participated today, especially our very special guest, that is the violinist Kirsten Leong, who is making his Toledo Symphony debut at this concert. Kirsten, thanks so much for uh, being a good sport and telling us all about uh, yourself and the music that you're bringing to Toledo. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you also to Zach and to to Maroon for for a great time. Enjoy myself. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org lab. You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. Don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the symphony by visiting their website at ToledoSymphony.com and their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find the TSO streaming platform online at stream.artstoledo.com. My thanks again to Zach Vasser, Merwin Sue, and our special guest, violinist Kirsten Leong. I'm Brad Cresswell. This has been Toledo Symphony Lab from FM91.